नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू दिस एडिशन ऑफ पॉलिसी प्रायोरिटीज आई एम वर्तिका नंदा दिस इज अ प्लेटफॉर्म टू लर्न अबाउट द वर्किंग ऑफ डिफरेंट मिनिस्ट्रीज ऑफ द यूनियन गवर्नमेंट एंड इन दिस सीरीज टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द विजन एंड प्रायोरिटीज ऑफ द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ होम अफेयर्स दिस मिनिस्ट्री सर्व्स एज एन इंपॉर्टेंट लिंक बिटवीन द सेंटर एंड द स्टेट लुक्स आफ्टर इंटरनल सिक्योरिटी ऑफ द नेशन एंड इज इंटरेस्टेड विद द टास्क ऑफ अदर नेशनल इश्यूज सच एज डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट We are fortunate to have with us Shri Shivraj Patil, the Minister himself. Shri Patil will be telling us what his policies and priorities are. We are also joined by Shri Pran Chopra, senior columnist and political commentator. Sir, welcome to the show. First of all, we would like to know why your ministry is termed as the Ministry of Home Affairs. Well, in some countries, the the responsibility of maintaining law and order is given to a ministry and it is called internal security ministry but in india this ministry's main job is to see that the center and the state have working relationship and function as per the constitution and to see that the federal structure is not affected in any way the policies and the plans made at the national level are implemented in the states in the districts and other places also that is why it is called home ministry and not only internal security ministry okay so you would like to ask something sir mr patel you are at the head of a illustrious ministry with a history going back to the days of sardar patel uh In the meantime, the political system over which the ministry and the government of India presides has undergone many changes. I would like to ask you: In what manner is it that the functioning of your ministry has undergone changes as a result of these overall changes in the polity? For example, at one time in those days, for many years after independence, it was the same party which was in power at the centre and in the states. and not once but for a long period of time how has the emergence of a very active multi-party system and a very active federalism as a result of that which affects what you described earlier on center state relations how has that affected the functioning of the ministry the constitution of india helps the union government and the state governments to discharge their duties as per the provisions given in the basic law of our country the three lists the union list and the state list and the concurrent list are very important from this point of view there are subjects on which the union government has the exclusive authority there are subjects in which the state governments have exclusive authority and there are subjects mentioned in the concurrent list over which the union government as well as the state governments have the authority it helps the union government and the state government to have uh, good relations with each other but when the question of policies as such yes appear yes and if one party is ruling at the national level and different parties are ruling in different state yeah. the question of bringing about understanding and obtaining cooperation becomes more complex yes. and difficult that should add in mind in yes uh, that is why uh, the governments at all levels have to conduct themselves in such a manner that as far as the constitutional provisions are concerned they are fully followed as far as policy making under different other laws are concerned they are at liberty to do so but while doing so they shall have to do it in such a manner that the best results are produced if this understanding is there there is no difficulty the uh, formerly there used to be meetings of the ministry of home affairs at the center ministries of home affairs or ministry of state affairs from the states very frequently into ministerial conferences and meetings mm. over the years i feel that that particular practice of the ministers at the central government and the state governments concerned has fallen into kind of a disuse has that affected 
the smoothness of functioning in the matters that you were referring to? Well, you have asked a very pertinent question. In uh, other constitutions, there are forums uh, in which the ministers and the representatives of the government at the national level and the representatives of the government at the state lo yes, level yes. come together and they discuss the issues which are relevant to the entire country as such. Unfortunately, that kind of provision is not there in Indian constitution. Mm -hmm. That is why Pandi Jawaharlal Nehru very rightly and imaginatively created National Development Council. And then he created the planning ministry and then he created the National Integration uh, uh, Committee. But all Council. those institutions they are, are receded in the they, actual they, functioning. They, they are the institutions which do not have the constitutional support nor they have yes. the statutory yes. support. Yes. They are created by administrative orders. But bef whenever the Congress government was in power, yes, yes. these institutions were used. Yes, yes. But later on, in some other governments, probably they were not used as yes. they used to be. Then there are zonal councils. Yes, those also yes. have fallen into disuse. Zonal councils uh, did not meet for nearly one and um, half decades yes. in the last but after we came to power, yeah. we start, have started meeting. One round of zonal council has already taken place. When was and the the second how long ago was the preceding round? 15 years. Oh. years. Sir, so we would like to know something about the Center State uh, uh, Relations Commission also. What is the role of this commission? Sarkaria Commission was appointed and it was asked to look into the problems which were faced by the Indian government and the state government. And I must say that Sarkaria Commission gave a very, very good report. That report was discussed in the Interstate Council and uh, they accepted some recommend, most of the recommendations were accepted, only a few were not accepted. Then the government took action on the accepted recommendations of Sarkaria Commission and nearly 80% of the recommendations have been implemented. Now we are trying to create one more commission. Now this we are doing because at that time uh, the Panchayati Raj system had not become a part of the constitutional system. Now the Panchayati Raj is part of the constitution of India. Moreover, the new technologies and new methods which have become available and developed throughout the world are also being used in our country. And because of these things, the relationship between the union and the state and then the districts and the taluka and the village bodies and utilization of the new technologies and methods and systems have created some problems, have helped both union government and the state government to function more um, uh, speedily. Uh, so, it was suggested that let us have one more look at the relationship and the provisions in the constitution with regard to relationship between the union and the state. Mm. So, we are trying to create mm. one more commission uh, which will go into all these things. Has that idea been accepted by most of the states? Uh, most of the states are enthusiastic rather than accepting, accepting it, it. Right, right. But because they think that that gives an opportunity to them to project their point of view. Since that has not yet come into being, would you like to throw more light on it as to how would it function and who, who would constitute it and uh, what would be the demarcation of its functions in relation to what you were referring earlier as the, the, the responsibilities of the union government, the responsibilities of the state governments and later on lower down also. The governments today have to make laws. Yeah. They have to implement the laws and the policies and they have to meet the demands of the people and then they are in judiciary mm -hmm. in the country. So the legislative, executive and judici judicial uh, actions are taken under the Constitution of India. These are the three wings of yeah, the government. Yeah. 
In matters relating to legislature, uh, sometimes the problems arise. Mm. In matters executive, more problems arise. In matters judicial, some problems have arisen. And so it was suggested, let them look at the provisions yes. relating to these kinds of activities to be done by the government. Would it be a statutory body? It is not a statutory now body. What would it be when it comes into being? Uh, it is a body created by the decision taken in the cabinet. I see. And um, terms of reference uh, would be given to them and accordingly they will function and they will examine the working of the legislature, executive and the judiciary at the national level. I see. Judiciary with very little but executive and legislature more. If there are any suggestion given by the members of the judiciary, they may hear. At the state level, they will do the same thing and then give a report. So um, when we talk about the Ministry of Home Affairs, people yeah. tend to associate it only with law and order. But the fact remains that there are other departments, there are various units in the ministry. Which are the areas you think are dealt with by the ministry which are crucial but are least talked about? The most important thing is the relationship between the center and the state. You cannot produce result without having good relations between the union and the state. But this is an area about which very little discussion takes place. There is very little understanding also. To understand this area, one has to understand the constitutional provisions and the seventh schedule of the constitution in which the three lists are given. Sometimes uh, people mix up the things. The constitution provides that there are areas in which the union government cannot interfere in the state activity and there are areas in which the state government has no right to interfere okay. in the union. Now, if the union government wants to interfere in the state activities, the only method available to it is to see that that government is not in place, it is removed and then the union government does anything. But that kind of action has to be considered by the parliament, has to be accepted by the president and then it happens. Moreover, these days, the matter is being looked into by the judiciary also. This, uh, you mentioned about Panchayati institutions earlier. In the states also, yes. increasingly, our, many of our Panchayats cover distant areas as large as what these states might be elsewhere in other countries. The, and uh, different parties c come to power in, at the Panchayat level compared with the uh, party in power at the state headquarters level. Would there be a similar kind of need felt or has it been felt in those parts of the country where the Panchayati Raj institutions have followed the constitutional amendment and empowered the powers proposed for them under the constitutional amendment? It was Mr. Rajiv Gandhi who was very keen mm. and he said in other countries the district administration and the local administration is also mentioned in the constitution yes, yes. but in India it was only in directive principles, cursorily it was yeah. mentioned, but no details were given. So he made the district administration, the taluka and the local administration as part of the constitution of India. And now it is provided in which areas the district administration shall have the authority and in which area uh, they shall not have the authority. That is Provided. So it is the same it pattern taken down to the state level between the state right. and district level that's right. as it's centered in district. That's, and that's, that's right. Even the distribution of the revenue or the finances mm. of the state government have to be distributed, have to be given to the panchayats as per the report given by the state finance commission. Yes. At the national level, we have the national finance commission which provides as to how the funds can be retained by the union government and what kind of funds can be given to the state government. Yeah. Yeah. The same pattern is followed at that level also. So, we will continue with our discussion but it <coughs> is time for a short break now. Keep <coughs> watching Lok Sabha Television. Man mein krodh aur akrosh, dil mein umange aur josh, dharna, pradarshan, julus, 
नारा पोस्टर बैनर झंडा ये भी है प्रजातंत्र का हिस्सा और यही है संसद मार्ग की दिनचर्या पुरुष आंखों में ख्वाब बसाए महिलाएं पलकों पर उम्मीदों के दीप जलाए सर पर सामान उठाए संसद पर नजरें टिकाए सरकार से आस लगाए ये लोग अधिकारों की लड़ाई के लिए यहाँ तक चलकर आए क्या मिलेगा इन्हें इनका अधिकार क्या सुनी जाएगी इनकी पुकार क्या होंगे इनके सपने साकार यही सवाल है हमारे कार्यक्रम संसद मार्ग का आधार Welcome back. We are discussing the working of the Union Ministry of Home Affairs, and we have with us the Minister himself, Shri Shivraj Patel. We are also joined by Shri Pran Chopra, senior columnist and political commentator. In this segment, we shall discuss about the internal security of our country. But before that, let's have a look at this report. The paramilitary forces work under the administrative control of the Ministry of Defence and the Ministry of Home Affairs. as armed force auxiliaries and are considered part of the indian armed forces in times of emergency the indian paramilitary forces are regarded as one of the world's second largest after china and has emerged as one of the world's most formidable paramilitary forces the paramilitary forces is made up of 11 organizations the pmf is made up of the following organizations Assam Rifles with nearly 33 battalions under the control of Indian Ministry of Home Affairs the Border Security Force currently with the strength of nearly 165 battalions or 2 lakh men the Central Industrial Security Force with a current strength of nearly 95000 the Central Reserve Police Force with primary role lying in assisting the state or the union territories in police operations to maintain law and order The Rapid Action Force which is a semi independent part of the CRPF with battalions numbering from 100 to 110. The Indo-Tibetan Border Police, the Rashtriya Rifles comprising 30 battalions with another 30 formed using regular army battalions. The Indian Home Guard with over a strength of 410,000 men, the National Security Guards and the Sashastra Sena Bal. The paramilitary forces are increasingly involved in protection of the people living in border states to supplement the work of the Indian Army. After partition in 1947, need was felt for special forces to control possible threats in border and other areas as the local police was busy with maintaining law and order. This led to the creation of different units of paramilitary forces who now number over 600,000. With induction of sophisticated equipment the paramilitary forces are becoming increasingly important to the security of the country and has become a vital arm of the nation's defense forces Shalini Verma for Lok Sabha Television The Home Ministry is responsible for ensuring national security internal security and law and order in the country Sir are you personally satisfied uh, with the performance of the ministry in this regard well first uh, of all i would like to make it clear that the national security is the responsibility of the union government and internal security is also a responsibility of the union government but law and order is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the state Thank government mm -hmm. the union list of the seventh schedule of the constitution mentions that the national security defense of the country is the responsibility of the union mm -hmm. government and article 355 of the constitution mentions that the internal security shall be provided by the union government but the item number 1 in the state list of the seven schedule mentions that the police and the law and order will be with the state government this fact is not understood by many many people in our country supposing something happens in a state it is not possible for 
the Union government to send its forces uh, to that state to take action against the culprits or the offenders. In America, it is possible. The federal police can go to any state. But in India, it is not possible. The, if the state government invites the union government, the union police can go and help. If the union government thinks that the situation has gone out of control, then the government in the state can be dismissed and then the forces can be sent there. But if the state government is in position, it, cannot, it, it, it may or may not allow the Indian police to go. This is not understood. Mm -hmm. So, this has to be in clear terms understood. But fortunately for us, there has been full understanding between the Union government and the state governments on this issue. And the Union government and the state governments have been cooperating with each other. We have the state police, which is nearly 17 lakh of men and officers. And we have the, un the, the union police, which are nearly 7 lakh of men and officers. Mm -hmm. The union police is used on the international borders. Un international border of our country with other countries is not protected at present by the defense forces. But it is the paramilitary forces which are there. Why this is being ha why this is happening? Because they think that if the army is standing face to face each other on international border, the chances of clashes are more. So they are keeping the army uh, in the second row, and in the first row is the paramilitary forces. So most of the union forces are deployed on the international borders. But whenever there are difficulties, in order to protect the property, the limbs and the lives of the people. Uh, any request made by the state government, the paramilitary forces, some paramilitary forces are made available to them. Now, for instance, in Naxalite states, uh, in fact, nearly 37,000 men and officers are given to the state governments to see that that menace is controlled. And in northeastern states also, the paramilitary forces are given to do this job. In Jammu and Kashmir also this is being done. But in hinterland, if the law and order is disturbed, unless it is specifically requested that you send it to the forces, we don't send the forces. This job is done by the state government. That is their first responsibility. But you mentioned the earlier on the distinction between uh, law and order problem on the one hand and security problem on the other hand. Is it not the case that increasingly the distinction between what is a security problem and what is a law and order problem is getting more and more blurred by the nature of the disturbance and uh, therefore um, the question of the drawing the line of responsibility, uh, the line, line between the responsibilities of the state government and the central government does not get blurred as a result of that. You are right. It does get blurred. Mm. National security is defending the country against the invasion from outside. That is uh, the job which is done by the defense forces. Yeah. But defense forces are also held by the paramilitary forces. And in sometimes the state force, or state police I'm, I'm also. I'm thinking more of the internal situation within I'm far coming, from I'm, the borders. I'm coming to that. So this has to be understood. Now, as far as the internal security is concerned, this is not as difficult to manage as defending the country is, internal security. Mm -hmm. But it is more difficult than just maintaining law and order. Yeah. So internal security has been the responsibility of the union government and it is done by the paramilitary forces generally. But paramilitary forces are also held by the defense forces, as in Jammu and Kashmir mm -hmm. in northeastern states. And paramilitary forces are also held by the state police, as in Naxalite affected states. But law and order, supposing a murder takes place, a decoity takes place, the union police will not go and what arrest about the that man. What thing called terrorism, which is so we will come undefinable. To, we, we will come to that. 
anything which is uncontrollable by the state police happening on a larger scale with a bigger design and which is using the modern weapons and modern technologies can be called terrorism or militancy or anything of that kind. Sometimes they mm -hmm. have started calling it mini wars, proxy yeah. wars and mm -hmm. things like that. So, internal security is in between law and order yeah. and national security. Yeah. And all the forces, defense forces, paramilitary forces, as well as the state forces. And then there are other forces like NCC and civil defense and the private defense. All of them are joining hands. But but is the that at the invitation of the state government? Yes. That also is? That's, that's right. Even a, a thing that is defined as of this defined by the national government as it as as a terrorist act. No, it there is no definition of the terrorist no. act as such. There is no definition of internal security. Also, mm. there is some cl some clarity on national defense and yes, law and order. Yes, yes. But internal security and terrorism, yeah, uh, the area. Uh, gets mixed up. So, as far as uh, modern crimes are concerned and modern, modern methodologies related to crime are concerned, do you think our police is uh, well equipped, well trained to deal with this? I think it is. Uh, people do not uh, know their strength. Uh, people do not know their, uh, enough about their training. And people do not know what they have been doing. Successful cases are not reported, not highlighted. <laughs> and uh, where the police has not been successful, they are highlighted. So for every, uh, um, uh, every case in which the police has not been able to control, there have been many, many cases in which the police and uh, other agencies like intelligence agencies have been able to do it. But they are not purposely highlighted also. Government also does not take pride in saying that we did this thing. When we talk too much about such things, that itself creates terror. So, we are a little careful in not yeah. highlighting them. But following up on that, are you, are you confident that the problem of terrorism is being tackled in such a way progressively towards better and better results and that the pace suggests that it may be controlled overcome in the near future? Yes. Now, if you are talking or if we are talking about terrorism, we shall have to consider what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir. Yeah, that's the terrorism in Jammu yeah. and Kashmir is, is reduced by half. Mm. Reduced by half. Mm. I am talking to you, mm. which will be seen by the people mm. on the TV screen. In some areas, it is more than that. So, there it is controlled. Mm. It is not eliminated but it is controlled mm. and it is brought down to half. If you go to northeastern states yeah. where the terrorism is there, there are different states and the situation in different state is different. If overall, you, would you say overall? Uh, I am giving you this. In, in Mizoram, mm. in Arunachal Pradesh and Tripura, totally controlled. Mizoram is most peaceful, Arunachal is most peaceful. And in Tripura, the situation has improved by 60 or 70 percent. In Assam, situation is fluctuating. Sometimes it is good, sometimes it is not good. Meghalaya used to be very good, but in recent times, one or two incidents have happened, which has caused some difficulties to us. Manipur was the worst affected yeah. state, but there mm -hmm. also the improvement has taken place and it is now improving. Nagaland was one of the most peaceful states, but in Nagaland, two groups are fighting against each other. Yeah. Yes. And because of <coughs> that, the situation in Nagaland has deteriorated. But if you take the sum total of it, the situation in northeastern state also has improved. Now, if you come to the Nexal affected uh, states, Andhra Pradesh was the worst affected state and they have shown wonderful